All right, so we can go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks everyone for joining today's webinar series. It's our first of three webinar series of What Lies Beneath, Signature Species of the Delaware Estuary. And today we'll be focusing on freshwater mussels. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Virginia Vassilotti and I am the Schuylkill Action Network Coordinator at the Partnership for the Delaware Estuary. I'll be moderating today's webinar along with Emily Bombach, who will be managing the Q&A. Emily, do you wanna turn on your video real quick and say hi? Thanks, Virginia. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Emily Bombeck, and I'm the Estuary Program Coordinator for the Partnership for the Delaware Estuary, and I'll be facilitating the question and answer sessions after each of our speakers today through the Q&A box. Great. Thanks, Emily. So before we officially get started, we wanted to go over some tech information for the webinar. First, we wanted to let everyone know that all participants are automatically muted with their video turned off when joining the webinar. So you should only be able to see presenters and moderators videos during the webinar as along with any presentations that they're sharing. Uh, the second point we wanted to let folks know about is if you have any questions during or after the presentations, please use the Q&A feature to ask those questions. Again, Emily will be moderating the Q&A box and we have some time allocated after both presentations to answer the, any questions. Third, the chat is disabled for participants. However, moderators will be sharing links and resources with attendees in the chat. And the last thing we wanted to share that is that the webinar is being recorded in case you'd like to view later on. And so for those who aren't familiar with the Partnership for the Delaware Estuary or PDE, we're an environmental nonprofit organization that is, was established in 1996. PDE is the host of the Delaware Estuary Program, one of 28 national estuary programs designated by Congress to protect America's estuaries. And our mission, mission is to lead science-based and collaborative efforts to improve the tidal Delaware River and Bay, which spans parts of Delaware, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. So before we get started, we'd love to learn a little bit more about the audience. So we'll be asking a couple polling questions to get a feel for who's in the room. So Leah, do you wanna go ahead and administer the first poll? So you'll see the, the first poll up here is about what sector you represent. And we have government agency, nonprofit, private entity, university or student, and just general interest of topic or other. So we'll give a few more seconds for folks to answer. All right, so the majority of folks we have today is actually government agency, then nonprofit and just general interests of topic. So it's great, great to see the diversity that we have here in the room today. Leah, do you wanna launch the second poll for us? Great, so this question is asking where you are tuning in from for the webinar. Mid-Atlantic, East Coast, Northeast Coast, Southeast Coast, Gulf Coast, West Coast, other or outside the US. So we see the, the majority of folks are from the Mid-Atlantic East Coast region, um, which was no surprise just because of the, the geographic area that we cover at PDE. And then finally, we have one last webinar just to hear, or one last poll just to hear how you heard about the webinar. It was PDE's social media, web blast email, our website, YouTube, from an employer or colleague, from a family or friend or other. Great, so you'll, you'll see the majority of folks today heard about the webinar from our email um, listserv that we have. So that, that's great to hear that folks uh, saw the webinar opportunity and are joining us here today. Leah, you can go ahead and stop sharing the poll results, thanks. 
All right, uh, and just real quick, we want to give a special thanks to Ramble for being a sponsor of today, today's webinar. And so for today, we'll have two speakers, Kurt Chang and Matt Gentry, who will present about freshwater mussels. Kurt will present first, followed by time for Q&A, and Matt will present second, also followed by time for Q&A. So as a reminder, please use the Q&A function, and Emily will be going through that to see if there's any common questions that arise, and we can filter those in after the presentations. And real quick, I'll introduce both of our speakers. And so Kurt and Matt, when I'm introducing you, if you can turn on your video just so folks can see you. First, we have Kurt Chang, who is the shellfish coordinator at PDE. His responsibility is to research the natural benefits provided by various bivalve shellfish found in the Delaware River Basin. He also helps to advance the freshwater mussel recovery program which aims to conserve and restore freshwater mussels throughout the region. And our second presenter for the day is Matt Gentry, who is the PDE shellfish, shellfish specialist. That's always a hard one to say. Um, his work is focused on the propagation and restoration of bivalve shellfish and the evaluation of ecosystem services. He supports freshwater mussel research through innovation and development of novel instrumentation in the field and lab. So with that, we can go ahead and get started with our first presenter, Kurt. So Kurt, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and you can go ahead and share yours. All right, so thanks everyone for tuning in today. We're gonna to share presentation here. And so hopefully everyone can see this. <clears throat> So uh, again, yeah, thanks for uh, your interest in freshwater mussels. Let's just go ahead and get started. Um, and I just wanted to mention at the beginning that uh, I also have a couple of poll questions to kind of keep people engaged and keep them thinking about uh, what we're talking about. And Matt also has a couple questions, so uh, stay on your toes. Um, here we go. So for this webinar, um, briefly, we're gonna go over just the Delaware estuary. Hopefully uh, people are generally familiar. Uh, we're mostly from the area, but we'll talk a, a little bit about how the water flows um, and why that's important for the animals that live in the estuary. Um, and then we'll talk uh, about bivalve mollusks in general um, and all kinds of different species, some that we know, some that we might not, um, and then narrow down specifically the freshwater mussels. Um, and so that'll be my presentation. I'll talk a little bit about their ecology and biology, why we care about them, why they're cool. Uh, and then Matt's gonna talk a little bit more about our freshwater mussel recovery program, as well as the Mussels for Clean Water Initiative. So some of the actual programs that we're uh, putting on at PDE uh, to research, restore, uh, and recover freshwater mussels in our estuary. So you know, what is an estuary? One of the, the basic questions that we get a lot um, and one of the simple answers is simply where the river meets the sea, um, or in another way to put it, where fresh water and salt water mix. Um, if you really want to get a little more in depth and wordy with the answer, you could say it's a transitional zone where fresh water from a river or stream mixes with salt water from an ocean. And these are largely considered to be one of the most productive ecosystems in the world. Um, it doesn't technically need to be salt and fresh water, but the, the water bodies need to be uh, very different. And so you're, it's basically that mixing between very distinct bodies of water um, is what the estuary is. And there's scientific uh, debate whether or not you can go up uh, into the, the, the two different waters, how much of the estuary extends beyond the mixing. Um, but really it's just where water mixes. Uh, and so here in the Delaware estuary, as Virginia said before, we have New Jersey on the right-hand side, and I think you guys can see my cursors, so I'm just gonna do one of these guys. Uh, we have New Jersey here, we have Pennsylvania over here, uh, we have Delaware down here, and so you have the Delaware River flowing down, and you have the Delaware Bay, uh, and of course you have the Atlantic Ocean here. So basically you have one-way flow of fresh water, but then you have two-way flow, so that's tidal water, uh, of salt water. And so you have the Atlantic Ocean pushing inside the bay and then pushing back out uh, twice a day. And so what this causes is a tide that goes all the way up to 
pretty much Trenton, New Jersey. And so Trenton, New Jersey is considered the head of tide. And what that means is that this fresh water up here only flows one way until Trenton. This water goes all the way up to Trenton and then flushes back down. Um, and that's important because that changes the dynamic uh, of the environment in which all these animals live, fish, birds, bivalves, you name it. Um, and so here we have fresh water all throughout this region generally. Uh, and that's different than this fresh water here because it's tidal. And so the tide rises and falls uh, in some places up to like six or seven feet. So we're not talking about, you know, maybe a foot. It's, it's a drastic change. Um, in addition, because you have this fresh water and the salt water mixing, you get this brackish water right in between. And there's a gradient. So down here obviously is a lot more salty than up here, but there's still salt. So no freshwater organisms would be able to live here. Um, and this is the same for all the tributaries as well. Uh, so you have tributaries up here, like the Schuylkill River is completely fresh all the way up to the headwaters. Um, but then down here, you know, some of these rivers are salty at the mouths, but as you go upstream, they become fresh. And so this kind of freshwater, brackish water, uh, not tidal to non-tidal flow uh, resonates throughout the whole estuary. And it helps uh, kind of uh, set up all these different locations for uh, uh, these different species. So let's move on to bivalve mollusks and start real basic. So there are animals in kingdom Animalia. Uh, more specifically, they're mollusks and not just many mollusks, but they're bivalve mollusks. So they're in class bivalvia. Um, and basically, you know, one of the, the, the easy things that I like to tell people is a bivalve is two shells, right? Bi is two, valve refers to the shell. And so these animals are two shelled organisms and the animal is actually the soft body that's inside the shells. So similar to like a turtle, the shell obviously is part of the animal, but there's a lot more behind the scenes inside that shell. Um, one of the interesting things about bivalves, uh, just like other aquatic animals, is that they have gills to respire, to breathe, um, but they also use these gills to filter feed. And usually the filter feeding bivalves will have bigger gills and multiple sets of gills. So they serve a purpose way more than just uh, breathing. And we'll talk a little bit more about why those gills are so important. Uh, and just to kind of reiterate, we have multiple species all throughout the estuary and the world for that matter. Uh, and they range from saltwater to freshwater species. Uh, there's brackish water species. And so it, rain, it they inhabit that entire range of tidal, non-tidal, uh, freshwater and saltwater. They have a range of commercial and ecological significance, if you might not already know. Uh, in the bottom left, you can see some uh, clams and scallops uh, on a dish. And so, you know, one of, the, one of the main things that people get introduced to bivalves through is food. So if you happen to live on the coast or if you just like seafood, you'll, you've probably eaten a bivalve. Um, we love to harvest them. We're really good at hunting them. Uh, and we're also really good at farm raising them. And so farm raised bivalves, generally you, you, you hear of it every now and then, uh, called aquaculture. And so one of the benefits of aquaculture of bivalves uh, and these kind of things link all together is that because they filter water, it's actually kind of a good thing for the environment because you're adding bivalves to an area that would uh, filter out some of the, some of the bad things uh, per se in the water. Um, one of the other reasons why we care about bivalve mollusks is for their products. So in addition to the meat, which we eat, um, they produce things like pearls. Uh, sometimes certain shells are valuable, uh, whether for their aesthetics or for their function. Um, driveways paved with shell, uh, shells are used in the pearl industry. Uh, so there's a lot of other products, ancillary products other than just food. Um, and of course, uh, in addition to them just being really cool, and we like them, uh, they provide uh, functional ecosystem services. So basically, they provide natural benefits to uh, us as humans, as well as every other organi organism that lives in those environments, just by them being uh, uh, in those uh, in those waters. And I'll touch upon these things uh, in just a second. So uh, you can follow along with me at home. These are some of the well-known bivalves. And so top left, it's a clam. Top right, mussel. Bottom left, scallop and oyster. And why do we why do we know about them generally? Well, it's because we see that we like to eat them. Uh, and even if we don't eat them, at least they're kind of iconic in the, the sense of what we see a, a bivalve is. So it's food, 
we have the clams on a half shell, mussels marinara, uh, seared scallops. You know, a lot of people don't realize the scallop that you eat is really just the adductor muscle, and there's a lot more to it. Um, and we have oysters. You know, that's a pretty iconic one uh, up here as well. So really, the, the take-home message is simply that salty bivalves are tasty bivalves. Um, we don't eat freshwater bivalves. We eat the saltwater bivalves. Uh, and there's a number of reasons for that. But uh, if you notice, next time you go out to eat and you happen to eat something with a shell on it, probably came from salt water. <clears throat> and just to hit this home, uh, eastern oysters, hard clams, they tend to live in more brackish environments. So this kind of green hash line, uh, we have oysters throughout the bay. We have clams uh, in the inland bays down in Delaware. Clams also live in these other uh, bay areas and estuaries. Uh, and then we have blue mussels, which live uh, more in more salty waters. And of course, scallops live a little more off the coast. But all these bivalves live in those salty areas. Up here in these freshwater areas, you're never going to find those bivalves that you like to eat. It's just a different habitat. So here's our first poll question. Uh, so Leah's going to pop this up in a second. Which animal can produce a pearl? We got three choices or maybe all of them. What do you think? Notice uh, I really didn't say exactly which species. These are kind of general terms. Uh, seeing a lot of oysters. That makes sense. A couple clams. All the above. Couple more seconds for everyone. Yeah, pretty much all of the above. So it's a little bit of a trick question, but really a pearl is simply uh, the bivalve's response to a foreign body that's uh, in its body. Um, and so unlike you and I, you know, we have if we get a splinter or something, we can kind of pluck it out. Um, if they can't kind of uh, open and close their valves enough to release that foreign body, um, it's just going to kind of encapsulate it. So that's what the pearl really is. Uh, so we'll move on. All right. So uh, back to the ecosystem services. Um, bivalve mollusks, most of them, uh, have shells that serve as habitat for other organisms, similar to a coral reef. Not exactly the same, but the concept is similar. So on the left, we have a freshwater mussel, uh, and macroinvertebrates like to lay their eggs on mussels. And so the, this is kind of important where if you're in an environment where there's only sand or maybe even silt or mud, those shells provide that rigid, hard structure. Um, animals also like to hide in, in and amongst those different bivalves. So a really good example is oyster reefs. So oyster reefs, in addition to providing vast amounts of oysters, um, they're providing all that space and, and kind of almost like a playground for all of these different fish to survive and live in in addition to uh, all the things I'd like to eat those fish. So it's kind of supporting this, this greater ecosystem beyond just uh, the, the oysters alone. Um, getting back to the whole gill of the, uh, of the bivalve, because they're filter feeders, they're effectively cleaning water just by removing particles. So this is kind of a funny comic that you see every now and then. It's not exactly like that, but maybe more like this. Um, so this is an Asian clam that you can see the uh, muscular foot on the bottom kind of stabilizing it because there's no sand. Um, and you can see the siphon here. So in short, most bivalve will have filter feeding capabilities where they draw in water and they're going to process that water. And what they're doing is they're stripping out really fine particles, eating what they want and rejecting what they don't. But just by them feeding and living in water, they're clarifying the water. And so one way to look at this is if we put two tanks next to each other with the same river water, we have mussels in one tank and nothing in the other tank, and they both have sediment. After about an hour, you can see that both tanks are a lot clearer, uh, and so the right one is more clear than the left one, though. And so the, the difference is that all the really big particles settled out regardless. That's why the left tank looks a little bit uh, lighter but it's still really murky. And so if we zoom in, that murkiness is really all those fine particles, uh, bacteria or anything below, let's say, uh, 100 microns. So, you know, not even a millimeter in size, really small particles. Those animals effectively ate all that material. And that's why you're able to see that rower behind the tank. Um, so this is kind of an easy demonstration to show that, hey, look, these mussels are actually filtering out uh, things in the water that really just stay in suspension. So on to our second question related. 
how much water do you think a freshwater mussel can filter in a day? Um, and this isn't exactly a, a hard answer, but generally, uh, how much do you think? And it depends on the species, it depends on the size, um, it depends on the water conditions, too much food, too little food. It uh, looks like we're trending towards 10 to 50 gallons. And yeah, so um, yeah, generally we say, we like to say about 10 gallons. However, 50 gallons, it could be a bit of a stretch, but again, it depends on the species. There's some species out in Mississippi and other drainages where um, they can approach, you know, almost like a dinner plate size. Um, and just to meet their metabolic demands, they're going to have to process a lot of water. Um, so good job, guys. All right, let's move on. So let's talk about freshwater mussel imposters. Uh, these are all freshwater bivalves, but they're not quite what we call freshwater mussels. Um, the first one is a pea clam, uh, also called a fingernail clam. And these are native. They don't really grow beyond uh, the size of your fingernail, so aptly named. Um, and so they're not freshwater mussels, but they do live in our freshwater systems. Um, and I'm not going to talk too much about these. I just wanted to mention them. So another one is the Asian clam. I mentioned it before. It's non-native, uh, but it is here. And you probably have seen its white kind of bleached shells on uh, if you stroll along any freshwater stream or uh, river. They're pretty ubiquitous. And then, of course, the zebra mussel. So most people usually know about the zebra mussel. Some people know about the Asian clam. And I'd be pretty impressed if you know about the pea clam. Um, but again, uh, zebra mussel is a non-native species. Uh, it tends to biofoul a lot of things. Um, I won't talk much more about these guys, but just know that they exist. And they're not mussels, but they do live in freshwater. Uh, so let's get on to our freshwater mussels. Uh, we have about 700 species worldwide. And it's kind of a lot of species. Uh, with over 300 in North America. So we have the most species of any continent. Um, and locally, we have a little over 10 species in the Delaware estuary. Um, third poll question. So we're gonna take a second and look at this photo. I told you there was about 10 to 12 maybe species in the Delaware estuary. How many species do you think are in this photo? It's kind of all the same color, but the shapes of the shells are a little different. So give it a second and tell us what you think. One, two, four, six. Wow, all over the place. That's good. That's exactly what I wanted. <laughs> four, all right. So uh, yeah, kind of a trick question. They're all the same species, uh, but I can, see, I can see three or four uh, potentially. Um, the shape of the shell is really reflective of how it was grown. Um, and so suffice to say, freshwater mussels are really flexible in the way that uh, they grow. Sometimes they'll look at completely different, different shells, different shapes, different colors uh, in different regions, but they're all the same species. So it's kind of a, a cool thing that mussels do. Um, so let's just introduce some of the mussels that we have in our estuary. Uh, top left, we have the Eastern pond mussel. Top right, we have the Eastern pearl shell. Bottom left, we have the alewife floater. And bottom right, we have the Eastern elliptio. So these are all kind of like, you know, maybe weird names to some people. Sometimes they're kind of cool. Um, but really, if you, look at the, if you look at the shells, you know, there's, there's all kinds of different colors, different shapes. This one has this kind of uh, tip at the edge. Um, this one I like because it's almost like a boomerang or like a banana almost. It has this indentation right here. Um, Interestingly, this alewife floater here, it's very nice emerald green uh, along the ventral margin, so along the bottom of the shell. Um, and this is actually the same species of that photo I showed you before. So, you know, really dark black shell versus emerald green. You know, it's just where it's grown. Uh, and even where it's grown, uh, you can have green, uh, red, yellow, brown, of all the same species. Eastern Lipto here, we have this kind of uh, nice bands of rings. The rings, you can't necessarily age the mussels, but it's certainly an indication of uh, the conditions in which it was grown. So here's our last poll question. Uh, based on kind of the names we said before, which is not a freshwater mussel? We got pistol grips, stone shells, leaf shells, or tidewater mucket. Give you a second to say that. So it's not a freshwater mussel. Uh, we got tidewater mucket kind of leading right now. Be curious what you guys think.
give him a couple more seconds. All right. Whew. Man, not a freshwater mussel. Tidewater bucket. All right. So let's uh, stop sharing the poll. And I'll say that, first of all, the pistol grip is a mussel. Uh, and that's what, there it is right there. Uh, not native here, but it is. And you can kind of see it it's kind of resembles a pistol grip here with that kind of uh, uh, dimpling and it kind of extends a little bit. Uh, then we have the leaf shell. And so this is considered extinct, but uh, again, this is a true mussel. You can kind of see it almost looks like a leaf, uh, certain leaves. And then of course we have the tidewater bucket. So yes, the tidewater bucket is actually um, probably our, our signature species of the Delaware estuary. Um, it uniquely lives in tidal water. The stone shell was the correct answer. Stone shell is made up. Um, so the tidewater market we have is kind of nice yellow with these green to blue bands uh, or rays that extend off of it. And so, um, yeah, like I said, they only live pretty much in fresh water and, I'm sorry, tidal fresh water. And so we have them throughout our estuary in the tidal portions. So where do these mussels live? Uh, so, well, it needs to be fresh, right? So pretty much all these areas, that's not the salty areas, uh, all the tributaries and everything else. And so what I like to say is, you know, bring it back to the, to the first principles and, and basics of, uh, of what it needs to live. So it needs to be fresh water. There needs to be oxygen in the water. Can't be just kind of a stagnant swamp. Um, it needs to have enough depth. So it can't freeze in the, in the winter and it can't dry up in the summer. So beyond that, uh, where do they live? Well, they, they actually live in the substrate, in, un, under the, the sand and, and mud and clay. Um, so, so long as that substrate is stable, uh, they'll live in it. And they can live in all kinds of different uh, sediments. And sometimes it depends on the species, but other times you can, you can have very generalist species that will live in sand, clay, silt, cobble, you name it. Um, so here we go, just as an example, we have the Eastern Elliptio here. You can see it's cilia pretty well, took this picture a couple years ago. Uh, and so this is the inhalant siphon. So that's where water goes in. And then the exhalant siphon, where water goes out, goes that way. And so there's another muscle here. And as a bonus for those with keen eyes, you may have already picked up, there's actually an Asian clam right here. And so same, same deal, inhalant siphon right here, exhalant siphon right there. All right, so the most interesting thing about freshwater mussels probably is their reproduction. So uh, to keep it short, they fertilize internally, which is rare. So most bivalves are broadcast spawners. The sperm and eggs go expel into the water column, tides and currents take care of everything else. These freshwater mussels, remember, most of them live in non-tidal streams one way. So if everything goes up, everything goes downstream, eventually you're not in the stream. However, these freshwater mussels have been able to adapt. And so males release sperm, females take in the sperm and fertilize their eggs internally so they have control. They're keeping their, uh, their glochidia inside of them and they're waiting for a fish host. And so this is another fascinating part of their, their life history. So these glochidia, these kind of Pac-Man type larvae need a fish host to reproduce. Once they attach to the fish host, then they'll settle out. And so there's all kinds of diverse strategies to kind of lure that fish close by. Um, this is a lure right here. We can see there's an eye spot. And these are actually just, this is part of the muscle. However, it kind of looks like a fish where you have these uh, caudal fins here and you have some of the, um, the dorsal spines here. This is the glochidium here. This is actually a Eastern Elliptio glochidia. Uh, and you can see these kind of spikes or spines, fangs, if you will. Um, that can actually latch on and help it uh, secure itself to a, uh, a fish gill. So uh, if you can see here, there's actually two, two muscles displaying right there. And so what you can see is there's a nice spot there, a nice spot there, same deal here. Um, and the general idea is that those that looked really promising is probably going to attract things like a large mouth bass. And so if Mr. Bass here finds one of these lures and says, hmm, that actually looks like my lunch, um, it will actually go close enough, maybe try to bite it. And if it bites it, it's going to break open those gills that are full of those larvae. And the larvae are going to get close enough to attach to the gills. So if, if it gets to uh, attract the bass uh, enough, then that muscle is able to reproduce. Um, if the lure is not really good, it's not convincing, it's probably not going to reproduce. 
So uh, a bit on conservation of mussels, uh, in, in, in a sentence, it's not so great. Um, there's a couple of generalist species that are doing okay, but generally uh, there's a lot of declines, both locally and nationally, as well, I mean, pretty much worldwide, really. Um, so there's no one main reason for decline. Uh, however, these are some of the reasons that uh, seem to be contributing uh, in, in, a, in, a good, in, a, in a proportional manner. So we have pollution, pretty pretty simple. Uh, if there's a chemical spill uh, and it kills everything in the area, well, guess what? Killed mussels do. Um, stormwater runoff is uh, another one where there's increased flow into our streams. Uh, it's going to disrupt the habitat. Remember, they live in the mud, in the sand. So if the sand is moving, well, they're moving too. Um, changes to water flow. You know, if uh, all of a sudden you put in a dam and the water flow drops, uh, mussels are uniquely adapted to live in all kinds of different waters. Uh, in addition, those dams impact fish. So the less fish that get up to the water, uh, sorry, to the mussels uh, that live in that water, um, you have less fish hosts to reproduce. So getting back to our life cycle, if you get rid of that fish host, there's going to be a problem. You're not going to be able to get to the juvenile stage to get to the adult. And so that's what we see a lot of times is only the adults survive uh, and we don't see juveniles. In a healthy population, you want both. So that's it for me. Uh, I went a little bit over and I think we're a little pressed for time, but I'll answer any questions now. And if not, uh, feel free to email me, kchang at delawareestuary.org. I'll be happy to, to answer any questions. Oh, Emily is muted. Thank you. Appreciate that, Kurt. Thanks. That was um, a very informative freshwater mussel presentation. So we do have about maybe five minutes or so to ask Kurt a few fret questions. If you know folks want to type them into the Q and A box, we might have had a few come through already. So let me take a look. And um, if we don't get to all of the questions, you can follow up with Kurt in an email, and I will put his email in the chat box right here so you can see that if we don't get to everything. So we did get right. a couple of questions about um, freshwater clams actually. So one was, I see people in the Schuylkill River around Norristown harvesting clams and assume that they were eating them. Um, do you know why they are harvesting them? Yeah, so uh, the, base, the quick answer is that they're, it's a food source. Um, in other countries, it's, it's a common uh, food item, and it's not something, I mean, they farm them, they can find them in the wild. Um, the, and this kind of brings up the whole, you know, why don't we eat freshwater mussels? Why don't we eat freshwater clams? Um, you could, I mean, you could always, you could eat anything once. Um, but the, the main issue, at least here, is that there's water quality issues. So you don't want to consume animals that are in, you know, most of our freshwaters aren't exactly the most pristine. Um, but the short answer is, uh, in a lot of uh, Asian countries, the Asian clam is, is a food source just like it is uh, elsewhere. And to, to add to that, Asian clams do only live a couple of years. So in terms of bioaccumulation or other issues, uh, it's less of a concern. A freshwater mussel lives a lot longer. So if you ate one of those, you're probably eating 20 years worth of pollution. Great, thanks. Um, so another one was how do you tell the difference between the fingernail clam and the Asian clam? Yeah, that's actually pretty easy. So if you have a small clam in fresh water, you know, it's one of those. Uh, if you rub your, rub your finger over the shell, uh, an Asian clam is always going to have really rough ridges. You're going to be able to, just like a quarter, you're going to be able to put your fingernail or something like hard like that, and you'll feel each ridge uh, kind of like the, the cog of a wheel. Fingernail clams will be smooth. All right, another question that came in, it might, some further information about uh, the zebra mussel. It might be more of a taxonomy question, actually. It's why is the zebra mussel not considered a mussel? What's, what is the actual distinction? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, my quick answer and it kind of goes beyond just the zebra mussel. Mussel and clam are simply 
terms. Uh, you know, if you talk to taxonomists and scientists, you usually don't use the common name uh, because it confuses people and common names aren't standardized or anything. So uh, case in point, there's some researchers that call what I call freshwater mussels, freshwater clams. Um, so really the clam versus mussel uh, terminology is kind of a, a sloppy one that is really, you know, there's, I'm sure there's some kind of history with seafood and everything, but uh, you know, if you, if you talk about a true, I guess, muscle, um, the muscles that those tend to be the epiphonal bivalves. So those are things that actually attach to things, things like blue mussels, zebra mussels, rib mussels. Um, they, pr they provide or they produce bissel threads that attach uh, physically to structures. All right, great. I think we'll do maybe just two more. And then again, folks, if you had any um, burning questions for Kurt, please send them to him um, via email. Um, but how about why don't we eat freshwater mussels? Yeah, so um, basically, you know, for one, uh, I guess I'll touch upon it. Freshwater mussels are protected in a lot of states. So you, you don't really want to just touch them or harvest them. Uh, we have special permits, scientific collection permits for all of our states that we work in. Um, additionally, they're long-lived species, and they live in oftentimes waters uh, less than pristine, so you don't want to get sick. Um, they also harbor uh, a couple freshwater parasites uh, as opposed to saltwater. Um, saltwater tends to be a lot more uh, clean in general. All right, we'll do one more. I think this is a good one. How did you get into freshwater mussels? <laughs> Uh, great question. So uh, I guess long story short would be I went to school and wanted to study something aquatic, uh, perhaps fish, and then I kind of got into the oyster world. So initially I worked for the Rutgers Haskins Shellfish Research Lab, um, and then I kind of moved my way into the Delaware Estuary over to partnership for the Delaware Estuary. Um, and we didn't do so much with oysters, but we did a lot with freshwater mussels. So we, we do support um, shellfish research in general, um, but freshwater mussels kind of grew on me, I guess. Great, thanks, Kurt. Yep, no problem. Thanks, guys. All right, I think we're going to turn it over to our next speaker today for this session, Matt. If you're ready right. to pull up your presentation, we'll move on. Yep. Uh, hi, everyone. I'll be getting my presentation up in a moment. All right, uh, is everyone able to see that? Yep, you're good, Matt. All right, great. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for tuning in. My name is Matt Gentry, and I'm a shellfish specialist at PDE. I've been with PDE for a little over two years, and most of my time has been focused on work relating to freshwater mussel recovery and restoration. And I also design and fabricate equipment that we use in the field and lab for various projects. This portion of the webinar will focus on some of the research and restoration work that PDE does with freshwater mussels. And if you have any questions during the presentation, please follow the same procedure as the last one with the Q&A feature. The Freshwater Mussel Recovery Program, or FMRP, is a comprehensive program intended to support the health of our region's freshwater mussel populations. It's part of a basin-wide shellfish strategy, which we also have that includes species such as oysters and rib mussels. And there are eight primary facets to the FMRP, which you can see here as conservation, restoration, propagation, habitat, research and monitoring, remediation, outreach, and surveys. Although PDE is involved in all aspects of the FMRP, today I'll be discussing some of our efforts relating to the three circles here, surveys, research and monitoring, and propagation. The first facet I'll be discussing is the use of surveys and how they fit into the conservation of freshwater mussel populations. 
By learning where muscles currently live, we are better able to understand the conditions that enable healthy muscle populations. Some of these conditions are the physical and chemical characteristics of the water body, known broadly as water quality, and others are the characteristics of the substrate, such as the sediment grain size and the stability. For example, if a stream is very flashy and will lose a lot of sediment. Many people are surprised to learn that there are some very healthy muscle beds in our region, including right near Philadelphia and Camden on the Delaware River. These beds are functioning without outside help. So the best thing we can do for them is to continue to support efforts that improve water quality and habitat. And those would be the conservation efforts of the FMRP. Uh, this photo right here is of a snorkel survey uh, that was conducted uh, to help assess the conservation status of one of the muscles that Kurt was talking about, the Tidewater Market. Uh, and this was a survey in collaboration with the Academy of Natural Sciences of Drexel University, the Pennsylvania Natural Heritage Program, and the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy. There are two broad categories of surveys that we conduct, qualitative and quantitative. Uh, the qualitative surveys are just looking to see if mussels are there, and if they are there, what species are there, what kind of diversity we have. Uh, quantitative surveys, on the other hand, actually count the number of mussels in a specific area. These surveys record size classes, which can help us understand the population trends. For example, if there's only adult mussels there, or if there's a healthy bed with reproduction and a lot of different size classes. PDE has conducted surveys in more than 75 bodies of water in this region. And both survey types are essential so that we can understand fully how the region's mussel populations are doing. Uh, this photo is from a quantitative survey that we did right by Bartram's Garden in Southwest Philadelphia uh, last summer in uh, summer 2019 on the Schuylkill River. Some of the survey methods that are used to assess freshwater mussels involve snorkeling, diving, wading, and even side scan sonar. Uh, different methods will be used depending on the environment that we're surveying in. And surveys are often collaborative efforts um, combining different group's expertise and also using citizen scientists and uh, school groups. Uh, so this photo here sort of shows the outreach component of the FMRP that ties into surveys. These were some students from Camden, New Jersey, assisting in a wading mussel survey. Most of the freshwater mussel work that PDE currently does can be broadly categorized as research and monitoring. This work advances the scientific understanding of everything from which host fish mussels use to the mussels ability to survive in different environments. The most common method of field research and monitoring that we do is the use of cages to grow mussels in natural water bodies. Here you can see some floating baskets uh, that we built uh, based off of designs from other groups that we've made some improvements on, as well as larger floating cages that are traditionally used in oyster aquaculture. And all of these contain mussels. Uh, keeping the mussels in cages can protect them from predators such as muskrat, raccoons, large fish, and birds, and also allows us to easily monitor the growth of these mussels. We use floating cages like those seen here, as well as benthic cages well, that would be anchored to the bottom of a stream or a river. Along with monitoring mussel growth and survival, we monitor the water quality at our, site, at our study sites. This includes dissolved water quality such as pH, temperature, dissolved oxygen, and salinity but it also includes measuring the particulate matter floating in the water, which is what the mussels eat as food. On the left here, you can see one of our cages anchored to a stream bottom. And on the right is a vacuum filtration setup that we use to filter out particles from the water and analyze their composition. We look for things such as the organic content in the uh, water, because that's ultimately what the mussels will be transforming into uh, nutrition. Water quality varies between locations and throughout the year. So by monitoring it along with muscle growth, we can gain some more insight into what conditions the muscles prefer. Caging studies that we conduct give us data on growth and survival rates of different species, information about water quality, and allow us to temporarily store muscles that will be used in future restoration work. We work in ponds maintained by partners such as Wintertour Museum and Gardens, Longwood Gardens, Suez, and various state and local governments, among others, to test varied conditions and assess restoration potential. By monitoring these mussels and the water they live in, we also learn about their ability to extract nutrients from the water column and can estimate their potential use for remediation of nutrient-rich waters. In 2019, we maintained over 40,000 alewi floaters in eastern pond mussels. And these photos uh, show mussels that are two months old at the top and about two years old at the bottom photo. 
before we move on, I've got a poll question. So Leah, if you could please bring up that poll. Uh, true or false, freshwater mussels are mobile and can move around the stream bottom. All right, yep, uh, the majority of people uh, got that correct. It's uh, true. Mussels can burrow and move around at will. They can't move very far, but they can um, move sometimes upwards of a meter per day, uh, especially in tidal areas. Uh, they, can, they can move up depending on where the, where the water level is, and they can find more suitable substrate to anchor themselves in using their foot. Uh, tagging and releasing mussels can provide many of the same data as caged mussel studies. Doing this allows the mussels to freely move around uh, and we are able to assess their growth in an environment that is more natural than a cage. This includes gaining some insight that we don't get from cages, such as predation. If we find broken shells when we monitor these sites, we're often able to determine what type of animals ate the mussel based on the damage done to the shell. Uh, the white marks on the mussel shown on the right are electronic pit tags that are applied with marine epoxy uh, that we can scan for using the device in the other photo. This doesn't hurt the mussel or impede its growth. And finding these tagged mussels helps us learn if they stay in place where we release them or if they moved around to more suitable habitat. And if uh, they stayed in place, then that stream could be a potential future restoration site. To date, we've tagged and released over 1800 alewife floater mussels. So where do all these mussels come from? In areas with abundant natural mussel beds, animals can be translocated to either establish a new bed or supplement an existing more sparse bed. Because there are not abundant mussel populations in our region, uh, we rely on a method that is common in other groups of organisms such as fishes. The final FMRP component that I'll be discussing, propagation. Propagation is the use of a hatchery or a laboratory to help spawn and grow mussels. This photo shows uh, the mussel larvae, or glaucidia, that Kurt was talking about earlier, that have been extracted from a, an adult female mussel. Uh, they have that Pac-Man type shape that they use to clamp down on the fish gills. Before I continue, we have uh, one last poll question. So Lee, if you could please bring that up. Uh, approximately how many larvae does an average female freshwater mussel produce at a single time? 1,500, 10,000, 100,000, or 1 million? All right. Uh, yeah, it looks like most people said either 10,000 or 100,000. Um, so the answer to that is those, those are correct. Uh, the answer depends on the species and the size of the mussel. Uh, the mussels that we usually work with in the lab generally have between 60,000 and 200,000 viable larvae, but there are some species that are closer to uh, producing around 10,000. And some species may also have multiple broods of larvae per year. Here we can see uh, Kurt on the left who presented before me collecting some freshwater mussels. To get them uh, into the hatchery for propagation, we go out with waders and clam rakes and uh, dig up from a natural healthy mussel bed um, that we know has abundant, abundant animals in it. Uh, and on the right is a close-up photo of a fish gill that is infested with the mussel glaucidia. Uh, generally, this doesn't do great harm to the fish. Uh, since it's in a controlled lab environment, we can kind of control how many larvae are going to latch onto the fish gills to make sure they don't get uh, suffocated. And after the propagation occurs, the fish and mussels are both released back into their native water bodies. Hatcheries allow us to grow baby mussels in an environment where we can control the water quality and other variables. New equipment, diets, and systems are designed and tested constantly. The photo on the left is of some juvenile mussels that are a few weeks old in a petri dish, and they're about one millimeter in length. On the right are some of the recirculating aquaculture systems uh, that we designed and built for growing juvenile mussels in the hatchery. The hatchery where we do our propagation work currently is at the Fairmount Waterworks Interpretive Center. This hatchery was built in 2017 and is located along the Schuylkill River and owned and operated by the Philadelphia Water Department in close collaboration with our scientists at PDE. 
Uh, we've been developing new techniques for muscle propagation here, such as uh, experimenting with different diets and um, aquaculture systems for growing the juveniles. We also conduct experiments here to discover which fish species may be viable hosts for different muscle, muscle species. Uh, and this facility is normally open to public viewing with its primary goal being outreach, but is currently closed due to the pandemic. Because of its broad uses, this hatchery fits not only into the propagation goals of the FMRP, but also into the outreach and research goals. And for anyone that doesn't know or isn't familiar with Philadelphia, this is right near the Art Museum along the Schuylkill River. And uh, finally, I wanna to touch on the Muscles for Clean Water Initiative. Uh, it's the next big step for PDE. We're currently in the process of designing and building a production scale freshwater mussel hatchery on the banks of the Schuylkill River uh, at Bartram's Garden. This hatchery will produce up to 500,000 juvenile freshwater mussels every year for use in restoration and remediation projects in the Delaware River Basin and also in the Susquehanna. This will be the first freshwater mussel hatchery built for the explicit goal of improving the health of the water that we all rely on and it's slated to begin operation in uh, 2023. Thank you so much for tuning into this webinar. I hope you found it interesting and have a better understanding now of some of the things that Partnership for the Delaware Estuary is doing to improve the status of freshwater mussels in our region. If you'd like to know some more information about mussels, uh, please visit the sites I've listed here, mightymussel.com, and uh, our website has uh, some information about freshwater mussels, among other things. And feel free to send me an email at mgentry at delawareestuary.org if uh, there's any questions you have that I'm not able to answer today. Uh, so I think we have a few minutes for questions now. If Emily, you wanna tee yep. those up. All right, yeah, thank you very much, Matt. That was great. I'm just gonna go ahead and put your email address in the chat as well for any of the questions that we don't get to. We can maybe ask you um, one or two. Um, here's one, does keeping mussels in cages prevent them from attracting fish hosts for reproduction? Yeah, so uh, good question. Uh, when they're in cages, they're generally juveniles that aren't um, able to reproduce yet. We have found that with some of our mussels in those cages or in other systems, um, they are fertilizing each other, uh, but that doesn't really happen until at least two years of age. And generally at that point, uh, we're using them for other projects. So the vast majority of our mussels that we have in cages uh, are going to be smaller juveniles that aren't really of a reproductive uh, size or age. And we do the cages, some of them, if we have larger mussels in them, the mesh size or the size of the cage is large enough that we do have fish, um, smaller fish kind of going in and out of the cages because it's good habitat for them as well. Great, next question. Um, how long do freshwater mussels typically live? Uh, that depends on the species. Uh, like with most things with freshwater mussels, it's a very large and diverse group. Um, but some species uh, in our area can live up to around 100 years. Great. Um, here's another question, Matt. This is more, I think, related to your data collection process. It was, do you use any sensors that are sending data to the cloud? If so, do you build them um, using open source hardware? Uh, I don't believe uh, for, at least for the freshwater mussel work at PDE, I don't believe we're using any of those sensors currently. Most of our data collection is going out into the field with calipers and uh, YSI or other water quality probe um, and collecting data manually and, um, or collecting water samples that we then filter and process manually. So at the moment, um, at least for freshwater mussels, I'm not aware of any any of that that we do. All right, great. We'll do just one more. Um, how long do the glycidia stay attached to the fish gills? That, uh, that also depends on the um, mussel species. And that's one of the things that we either learn from literature or if there's not good literature on it, that's some of the experimentation and research we can do in the hatchery at the Fairmount Waterworks. Some species will drop off after 10 days. Some will stay latched on for three weeks. Um, so that kind of, yeah, it depends on the species of mussel, the species of fish, uh, but generally between 10 and 30 days is probably a good ballpark estimate. 
All right. Well, great. Thanks so much, Matt. And thank you, Kurt, as well. I'm going to just turn it over to Virginia for um, some wrap up. Great. Thanks, Emily. And thanks again, Kurt and Matt. I'm just going to share my screen real quick uh, for the wrap up. Uh, so for folks who aren't familiar with our comprehensive conservation management plan, uh, we wanted to provide a little bit of information for you all today. And so really one of, one of the main reasons that we care about this great work with freshwater mussels is because uh, of the efforts to implement key strategies in this CCMP plan for the Delaware estuary. And so the plan was written to guide the efforts of environmental agencies and organizations across the region for watershed improvements. And today's webinar closely relates to CCMP Healthy Habitat Strategy H3.3, which is to inventory, restore, and manage mussel populations. And if your organization is conducting work to protect and improve the Delaware estuary, please share your success stories with us on PDE's Our Plan page on our website for a, a chance to win some cool prizes. And I believe Emily is gonna add some of these links into the chat for everyone. And we do have two more webinars coming up in this series, What Lies Beneath Signature Species of the Delaware Estuary. Our next webinar uh, is in two weeks, which is focused on oysters and that is scheduled for Tuesday, August 11th from 12 to 1 p.m. And our third webinar for the series is on Tuesday, or Tuesday, August 25th, also from 12 to 1 p.m. And so thanks again for everyone for attending today's webinar. We hope you found it informative and engaging and please consider making a donation to PDE to help us achieve our mission. Any amount helps. And so we'll be sending a follow-up email that includes the webinar recording and important links and resources for you to access after today's webinar. Uh, so we hope to see you at our future webinars and thanks again.